This is Taiwan, or officially the Republic of China, a country in East Asia, which if you can't tell by how delicate I'm being with these titles is consistently under a bit of a, let's call it scrutiny. The Republic of China primarily occupies this island here, but it officially lays claim to all of this area, which of course makes the People's Republic of China very angry. To make matters worse, the People's Republic of China, headquartered in Beijing, the China that you and I would normally think of when we think of China, lays claim to this island as well. So the whole thing's a bit contentious. So contentious in fact that any country that is doing business with the People's Republic of China, you know, China China, has to officially declare that they recognise the island of Taiwan as the sovereign territory of the People's Republic of China. While this is all very confusing, the fallout is that the nation of Taiwan is only officially recognised by a tiny selection of countries from around the world. These countries include economic superpowers like Guatemala, Haiti, the Marshall Islands and Vatican City, collectively accounting for around 50 million people and covering a tiny portion of worldwide trade. So. It's not exactly like they have brought their A-team there either. In fact, about two-thirds of the people that officially recognise Taiwan as a nation are the citizens of Taiwan. There are some sovereignty claims in Outback Australia that have been more widely recognised than this nation of 23 million. This isn't just something that is brought up to poke fun at the country or to dazzle viewers with intriguing factoids either. This whole situation has some very serious political, social and of course economic consequences. On one hand, the nation is consistently living under at least the passive threat of being invaded by one of the world's most powerful militaries, but even more mundane realities become an issue. Things like trade deals, raising finance on international markets or even setting up international business operations is very difficult in a nation that almost every other nation in the world swears does not exist. But have we seen this all before? Nations that are born out of political separation, live with hostilities from world superpowers, scare off international businesses and fail to even raise capital can only really go one way, right? Well, maybe not. Despite all of these substantial hurdles, Taiwan powers on. It has a GDP per capita of $25,000 and an average net worth per citizen of $142,733. Those are per capita GDP figures that are only beaten out by Japan and South Korea in the region and average net worth figures that are only beaten out by a very select group of the wealthiest most developed nations on the planet. So, what is going on here? Why are countries so quick to dismiss Taiwan as not a real nation? What issues does this cause in an increasingly globalised world? How is it that Taiwan has been so prosperous besides this? And of course, once we have finished going over all the nation's quirks and features, we have to give it an EE score. This video is brought to you by Acorns, the investment app that automatically rounds up your purchases to the nearest dollar and then auto invests that spare change for you into your diversified portfolio. Acorns also offers the only checking account that provides you with a heavy metal debit card that saves and invests for you as you spend. More on that at the end of this video. Sign up now by going to acorns.com ee or click the link in the video description below and Acorns will deposit $5 into your portfolio to help you get started with investing. That's acorns.com slash ee. So before we get into exploring this very particular country, nation, island, place, we must first understand why there is all this confusion about what this actually is. If you ask the average person on the street what Taiwan is, they are likely to say, well, it's a country. And in many ways, that recognition is the only thing that really makes a country a country, rather than a madman planting a flag in their cattle ranch. But if this seems so simple to an average person, why has this place been shunned by the world? Well, as with everything, it comes down to history and politics. The Republic of China, the one that is now the government of Taiwan was formed in 1912 after the revolution that saw the end of the imperial rule in China. At this time, 
the island of Taiwan was actually still a territory of Japan. Now 1912 was not a great time to start a new government because in just three short decades following its formation, the country went into warlording chaos, which started a civil war, which was only truly brought to an end when Japan invaded mainland China. Once that common enemy was dealt with, it was straight back to civil war between the Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party. They fought back and forth for four years and eventually the government representing the Republic of China was facing almost certain defeat. So they did what anybody else would do. They packed up all of their gold and currency reserves, loaded them onto ships and sailed away to find some tropical island in the Pacific. Taiwan, which had been handed over to China after the Japanese defeat in World War II, did nicely for that. A temporary capital was established in Taipei to serve as a wartime base of operations for the nation and then basically nothing ended up happening. I mean, the nation shook their fists back and forth at each other across the South China Sea, but outside of that, the newly formed People's Republic of China got down to being a worker's paradise, go watch our video series on China to find out how that went, and the Republic of China, or Taiwan, got to establishing any nation at all. This was actually a surprisingly long process because for the majority of the country's history, Taiwan genuinely saw itself as a temporary misplaced military center that was just biding its time to take back the mainland from those pesky revolutionists. It wasn't really until a new president was elected in 1988, almost 30 years later, that the nation started to realize that maybe that dream of taking back the motherland wasn't going to happen and maybe we should learn to appreciate what we have. With this, things like martial law were put to an end. And yes, the nation lived under wartime martial law for over 30 years, but it also did more symbolic things as well. The rhetoric of the nation was changed to be proud of Taiwan. The government structure was changed from treating the island like a territory to recognizing it as a nation in which to be governed. Banknotes were now minted by the Taiwanese Central Bank rather than the Provincial Bank of Taiwan. Now of course, this recount of history is extremely brief and I definitely recommend reading about this separately, not only because it's fascinating, but because it has been so extremely influential in the modern day. But the takeaway for the sake of the economy should be that all of this poised the nation nicely to make the transition from some bitter outpost of a shunned regime to one of the economic miracles of Asia. When the government that went on to form Taiwan was planning their sweet escape, they were very clever with what they packed. The piles of gold and foreign currency reserves were definitely a big win and were instrumental in fighting off hyperinflation during a period of currency transition in the newly established country. But there was potentially an even more valuable type of cargo that they brought with them. Smart people. You see, the Chinese Communist Party was not exactly an intellectual's paradise. In fact, people that were seen as prestigious academics or elites were branded as class enemies and yeah, well, that wasn't great for them. So when the option of legging it to this new island was presented, there were plenty of very smart, very innovative citizens that were fully on board. Literally. A combination of this strong academic background as well as some infrastructure left over from Japanese occupation made the nation a hotbed for a technical revolution. As soon as the whole martial law thing cooled off, this all came to form pretty quickly. For a long time, Japan had been the low cost, high quality manufacturer of things like consumer electronics, home appliances and manufacturing components, but Japan was running into a problem. They were becoming too rich. By the 1990s, the average salary of a Japanese worker was comparable to that of the average American worker. So low cost manufacturing was no longer their domain. This situation is collectively known as the middle income trap and we have explored it many times on this channel when we explored countries like Brazil, China, Mexico, and yes, of course, even Japan. The takeaway here was that Taiwan was ready to fill that hole and they were ready to do it a full decade before mainland China was even on most international companies' radars as a place that you would ever consider doing business. This head start of being in the right place at the right time with the right workforce meant that the nation attracted a swathe of international companies like Foxconn, IBM and Sony, 
What's more is that they use this momentum to start a collection of very well known companies themselves. HTC, Acer and Asus are all headquartered in Taiwan and sell products all over the world. Because of this, Taiwan has built up one of the strongest current account surpluses of any nation anywhere. Their huge foreign currency reserves further help with this because they were able to exchange money easily with other nations to assist with trade, while being able to monitor their own currency to make sure that it stayed competitive. So it looks like this was a happily ever after kind of scenario for Taiwan, right? Well, not exactly. You see, being so heavily dependent on trade came with some problems. How can you trade with nobody? A lot of international trade in the world today relies on trade agreements. These are formal agreements between two or more nations that they won't tax the importation of certain items from another country. Now, we have explored the benefits and drawbacks of international trade many times before, so I don't want to repeat too much here, but what's an important takeaway is that these are formal agreements between two countries. Because the Chinese Communist Party put so much pressure on the international community, including the UN, not to recognise Taiwan, almost nobody does. It may not be the right thing to do, but when the decision is between access to the second largest consumer market in the world and a source of technical manufacturing, unfortunately, most nations are forced into looking the other way for the good of their domestic businesses. This kind of control even extends to things like embassies, where most nations around the world do not have a Taiwanese embassy, but will instead have the rebranded Taipei Economic and Cultural Representatives Office, which is definitely not an embassy, wink wink nudge nudge. This pandering to China to ignore Taiwan might not be the right thing or the moral thing, but you know what? Money talks. Now the result of all of this is that it's extremely difficult for Taiwan to get a seat at the table because the international community knows that there is only room at that table for one China and they would rather talk with the big rich one. This has all meant that Taiwan has had to focus its exports primarily on very technical goods with a large margin for value adding. They just wouldn't have the connections or the capacity to turn a profit in trading commodities and fortunately they haven't needed to. Today, the nation's biggest exports are semiconductors, wireless communications equipment and flat screen displays. All items that rely more on brand name and reputation rather than simply being the lowest bidder like corn, oil or iron ore. That's not to say that this problem is solved by any stretch of the imagination for the country and as other nations move into their technical industries they are going to increasingly feel this pressure. But a solution has come from a relatively unlikely source, mainland China. This month marked the 10 year anniversary of the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement which is a bilateral trade agreement between this China and this China. This agreement has made mainland China the main import and export partner of Taiwan, which many have pointed out may put them in a very precarious position should the animosity between these two nations ever come to the forefront again. Either that or maybe making money through trade will strengthen their relationship into the future. Let me know what you think in the comments below. The most reasonable answer for or against this strong trade relationship will get featured in the next video. Like this comment right here, which thoughtfully made the distinction of component parts in GDP calculations from the video earlier this week on why GDP is a terrible measure. Thank you for the brilliant explanation and doing my job of explaining the economics for me. Okay, so now it's time to put Taiwan on our national leaderboard using our predetermined categories. The list is actually currently topped by something that blurs the line between city state and nationhood, so let's see how Taiwan does. With a GDP of $586 billion as of 2019, the national economy of Taiwan is one of the largest in the world. But it doesn't break into the trillion dollar club and it's still obviously a very very long way behind the true superpowers of China and the United States, so it gets a 7 out of 10. GDP per capita is an interesting one. The figure is just under $25,000 per year, but the average citizen's net worth is exceedingly high even by developed nation standards. 
Either way, GDP per capita is the metric, so I have to give it a 7 out of 10. Stability and confidence, well, this one is quite difficult to say the least. The nation has been free from a lot of the political instability and hostilities that probably would have plagued any other nation in this position, but a lack of a seat on the UN and a very powerful historic rival at its doorstep means it can only get a 4 out of 10. Growth The economy has doubled in the past two decades with an average annual growth rate of over 4%. It is certainly slowing from its industrial transition period, but it's still very very strong. It gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, industry. A strong balance of trade surplus fueled by very technically proficient industries that are fueling the information age mean that this nation has done very well for itself. Its very well educated population means that these industries should continue to thrive despite hostilities and the nation gets a 10 out of 10. Altogether, the country gets an average score of 7.2 out of 10. A very impressive score that puts it in equal second place with France. Taiwan is one of those countries you could almost forgive for being a complete disaster, but despite a short and tenuous history, it is not. Sure, it's had some wins along the way and yes, it has been in the right place at the right time, but it was able to capitalise on this in a way that not many other nations would have. So if there is a takeaway from the vivid economic history of this nation, it's that sure, Natural resources, trade wealth, or even a friendly spot in the world can be very helpful for building a prosperous economy, but the greatest resource a country can have is its collection of smart and technically proficient people to make the most of whatever opportunities they are given, no matter what the situation. So what do smart people all have in common? They plan for and invest in their future, all of which is made a lot easier with acorns. Acorns is your all-in-one financial services app that makes investing as easy as spending. Speaking of spending, have you heard of Acorns Spend? Acorns Spend is the only checking account that provides you with a heavy metal debit card that automatically saves and invests for you as you spend. Even better, your Acorns checking account comes with no overdraft fees, no minimum balance requirement and fee-free access to over 55,000 ATMs all around the world. Now that's a card. My favourite feature is Smart Deposit, which enables you to automatically set aside a percentage of your paycheck into your saving, investment and retirement accounts before you can spend it. And guys, that is just the beginning. The list of features goes on and on. Join 7.5 million others by signing up now at acorns.com ee and Acorns will deposit $5 into your portfolio to help you get started with investing. That's acorns.com slash ee. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Thanks for watching guys. Bye.